Providing effective care coordination can be challenging and complex, especially for children and youth with special health care needs who receive care from numerous providers and systems. That is why we partner with providers, the patient, and their family to deliver a collaborative self-management care coordination model. Participants can expect our experienced community health workers and RN care coordinators to help them address barriers in care, develop a shared care plan, and find resources that best fit your family's needs. This presentation will prepare families for current and future advocacy needs. Our objectives are to provide you with an understanding of the different types of advocacy and the impact it can have on your child and community, and an advocacy framework with tips and tools for building effective systems of care for your child and other children and youth with special health care needs in the community. First, you will hear from Renee Everett Sanzone, the Executive Director of the Parents Place of Maryland, who will talk about community advocacy versus systems advocacy, followed by some tips for families who plan to serve on advocacy groups and or committees or boards of mission-driven organizations. Then you will hear from Robin Elliott, a partner with Public Policy Partners, who has over 15 years of experience in legislation, the state budget process, and healthcare finance. As parents of children with special health care needs, you know your child best. You are their strongest advocate. Here at the Parents Place of Maryland, we support and empower parents year round to make and affect change at a community and systems level. Today, you are going to learn how sharing your lived experience and personal stories and investing in skills development can make you an even stronger advocate. There are two types of advocacy where you can make a difference. The first is community. Community advocacy is personal. It is about defining your community and figuring out how you can make a difference in your personal community. When you think about your personal community, think about where you live, and what opportunities there are for involvement. Personal community can mean your city or town, your local school system, or even your faith community. And as you probably know, there are multiple opportunities to get involved in your local community. You can serve on a local transition council, local care team, a disability agency board, an advisory committee, or something else. The second type of advocacy is systems advocacy. Systems advocacy is where policy is developed and implemented. It is also where financial investments are made. Systems advocates can affect change at the state and or federal level. You don't have to be a professional advocate to affect change at the systems level. Some examples of how you can engage in system advocacy include joining a consumer group that reviews and looks at changing policies, a commission that advises a state agency, a council that advises an organization or a nonprofit board. A major benefit to systems advocacy is that you can help make a difference for other children with special health care needs. You can also help increase funding for programs and services. This form of advocacy includes using your voice to testify on an issue and establishing relationships with your elected officials. Now that you understand that there are two types of advocacy, community and systems advocacy, the next step is figuring out how you can take your passion and knowledge and use it to use it as a powerhouse for change. You do this by serving. However, we know that choosing when and where to use your voice can be overwhelming with countless opportunities to choose from. And the fact is you have limited time available. There are many different types of groups. There are boards, task force, committees, advisory groups, work groups, evaluation groups, and many more. 
So where do you start? You start with identifying what issues are most important to you. Then ask yourself, do I want to make a difference in my personal community or at a systems level or both? Think about the needs of your child. What are the gaps in care that you or they have experienced? What type of changes are you most interested in? You can then marry your personal advocacy experience, your personal knowledge, with the issues you want to address, your passion, to find the group or groups that will help you make a difference, make a change at the community or systems level. Before you start any sort of advocacy effort, you need to get to go over a checklist. Do you have the time? Seriously, we must ask ourselves this question. And then the next slide, we will go over a tool that can help you assess if you have the time to take on a new opportunity. So many times we as family members care so deeply and want to make things better for all families that we tend to say yes when maybe we should say no. Now, if you do have the time, you need to prioritize which group and which requests are the most important to you. Lastly, you need to learn the skills needed to serve on groups so that you have the opportunity to make the biggest impact to truly affect change and make things better for families. It isn't enough to just be a family member and have passion. Those are important. It is the fire in the belly. It is the lived experience that probably no one or very few sitting around the table bring. The skills help us harness all the passion and all the power. In this slide, before we ask the question, do you have the time? Not meaning to be funny at all, but sometimes it's hard to answer this question. This tool is one we use at the Parents Place of Maryland to help prepare families for serving on advocacy groups. The tool is meant to help you identify what's on your plate and help you prioritize your commitments. As you can see, the vertical area arrow shows high time and low time, and the horizontal arrow shows high energy and low energy. To start, let's grab a piece of paper and draw these two lines. Now think about everything you are currently doing with groups. Write down each of your commitments and think about how much time and energy it takes for each. One by one, does the group require a great deal of your time or very little? Is it requiring a lot of your energy to be on it or very little? Now ask yourself these questions for every group you are involved with including groups that aren't related to special health care needs or disabilities. For each group, write them down in the quadrant they fall in. If it is a group that is in high time and high energy, it's going to be in the top right corner. If it is a group that is high time and low energy, it goes in the bottom right corner, and so on and so forth. Once you have finished, look at, look at the chart. This should let you know quickly, do you have the time? If you have the time, say yes. If you don't have the time, but the request to join the group is important to you, then maybe look at what you are currently doing and adjust. Give something up or shift the amount of time or energy you're investing in something else. This is a nice way of giving you a visual representation of all the work you are doing related to your advocacy work. It is one thing to be passionate about making a difference and getting, in, getting involved. It is admirable, and we definitely need the family voice. We are the ones using the service, so we should be at the table to make sure our voice and the voices of others are heard. But we really do need to learn the skills so, so that all of our passion is really moving toward a change that makes things better for all children with special health care needs. As I mentioned earlier, there are many different types of groups. You have to figure out which group is the best fit for you with your time, your interest and passion, a committee, a task force, a board, an advisory group, for example. 
And then you need to understand the functions of the group. How often does the group meet? How is it run? Telling your story. This is a balancing act. Our story is always important, but when you are serving on a group and your story is to move the work forward or the issue forward, and it should be used to lift up all families' voices who are experiencing the same issue or dilemma. It isn't only about our own situation. Telling your story is an impactful way and useful skill to learn. Last, but certainly not least, is data. When we do this work, emotions are important. It is the passion and heart of the work, but decisions need to be based on data. Data is cr critical to assisting our work with children. Timely and accurate data can be one of the most important tools as it can make a case more persuasive. To assist you in this endeavor, to find and use data you want or need, use the three-step process. First, define your purpose. Why do you need the data? This can be to illustrate a need, reduce uncertainty, inform public opinion, prove to others what you already know in your day-to-day -day experience. Based on your purpose, what data do you actually need? Do you need people data, age, race, gender, Events dates, births, death, things data, places and organizations. Step three is to explain the data. To understand the data, you Hello, my name is Robin Elliott. I'm very excited to be with you today because I am a systems advocate. And it is really important for my work to work with families and individuals just like you. You make the difference. Systems advocacy at the core is about translating personal experience to system-wide change, whether that is within a neighborhood, a city, a county, a state, or even on a national level. So I'm very pleased that you're joining us today. You can do systems advocacy in really six steps that we're going to talk about today. I wanted to let you know that I have really seen countless times individuals make a difference. I know this sounds cliche, but it's really true. And I'm going to share just one example with you. I worked with a young man who, as an adolescent, was experiencing many health issues that his education system didn't pay for, so he needed his insurance for his occupational therapy, his speech therapy, and his physical therapy. 
but insurance coverage didn't work very well. And he was very frustrated and he saw how it affected him. So when he was a little bit older, he went and talked to legislators, other advocacy groups, individual advocates like himself. And in the end, he inspired a groundbreaking bill, which has improved insurance coverage for everyone in Maryland. That advocate is now a paid advocate in Washington, DC. So advocacy can be a path as a volunteer, or it can be potentially a career. Whatever your pathway, I'm glad you're here today. One of the first things you'll wanna do is select an issue and prioritize. This sounds simple, but I know it's not. From personal experience, there's so many things that you wanna change in this world, but we don't have time, or at least I know I don't. So select one or two and then start thinking about what are the solutions. These solutions can come from your personal experience. They can come from recommendations of other organizations or all of the above. But at the core, ground everything with your personal story. In the end, it's your personal experience that is really gonna make a difference in your advocacy journey. Step two, you may wanna think about teaming up with an organization. Organizations have more resources than many of us as individuals, and they can really help move the needle on a policy issue. First, of course, you wanna make sure that that organization aligns with your mission and your vision. You also probably wanna look at, are they open to consumer participation. There are ways to tell. Does that organization have a newsletter which talks about individuals advocating? Does it have a policy committee, events that can be participatory that feature policy issues? You can check it out. You can join a newsletter or attend an event or volunteer. You don't have to decide all at once you can look at an organization and decide as you go along if it's the right fit. And of course, identifying the decision makers. These are your state officials, your county officials, even your legislators. If you live in Maryland and you need to know who your legislators are, you can go on the website right on the screen, www.mdelect.net. Type it in, type your address, and you'll get the whole list. Finding those legislators and then determining where they are in the issues that matter to you. You can research them, you can look at their website, you can look at other organizations. And then the other thing I would suggest is find out a little bit about them personally. Sometimes those personal connections are really what matters the most. Do you share? A school? Do you share a gym? Do you go to the same grocery store? Do you have some mutual friends? All of these things are important. And then find an opportunity to connect to that legislator. It could be in person or virtually. There are many opportunities. There are town halls. Many legislators also enjoy one-on-one -on -one meetings with their constituents. And then Think a little bit about the legislative process. This doesn't mean that you have to be an expert, especially starting out. It is definitely learn as you go. There are two core processes, whether you're working on a local level, a state level, even a national level. You have a budget process, sometimes called an appropriations process, and then a policy or bill process. Each of these processes have separate committees that make those decisions. So just like you're gonna find out a little bit about your own legislator from your district, find out a little bit about the people in charge of those committees. What makes them tick? What are their stances? Step five, communicating your views. 
This can be challenging, especially when you first start off. Know going in that you seldom have a long period of time to meet with an official or a legislator. So being organized and even practicing ahead helps. We have a couple tips for you. Start off by identifying yourself. And if it's a legislator, identify your neighborhood or somehow indicate to them that you are a voter, you are a constituent. Always state your purpose. You want to state that right up front so they know what to expect and what to listen for. Also know going in that they may not be an expert in this issue. Legislators such as in Maryland sometimes deal with 2,500 bills a year. There's no way they can understand all the ins and outs. They really rely on others to share their expertise. Always weave in your personal story. This is really the cement, the glue, the thing that people remember when they leave a meeting. Facts and figures are important, but that personal story is really will motivate them to change, to change the system. Know that you might have to be very brief. Of course, always thank them at the end. They will thank you. Everyone's time is valuable. And probably the most important thing is to create an opportunity for follow-up. Advocacy is seldom done in one meeting. It is over time. So whether it is that you're going to get back to them with more information, you're going to let them know about what happened at a community meeting, or even setting up a follow-up meeting, whatever it is, create that second opportunity, that third opportunity to interact with them. suggestions, especially if you live in Maryland. The organizations that I've featured on this slide here, the Coordinating Center, the Parents Place, all very active in Maryland. If these organizations are the right fit, they may be the organizations you want to team up with in your advocacy journey. Follow them on social media, join their mailing lists, send them your stories. And I wanted to flag one of the best, most exciting advocacy events all year in Annapolis, and that is the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Day. This has been time and time again, one of the most effective advocacy events I've ever seen. It has moved bills to the finish line repeatedly. So it's a really exciting way to start off your advocacy journey. And no matter what path you take, I hope our paths cross one day. Thank you.